Not all disagreements among intellectual equals are so easily resolved. And if we think about it, most of our disagreements with other people are not so easily resolved. So let's look at a different case. Suppose an animal horn with holes in it has been discovered in a Neanderthal settlement. This raises a problem for paleontologists because it's widely thought that Neanderthals did not have the intellectual ability to create music or the manual dexterity to finger a flute. On the other hand, this thing looks awfully like a primitive flute. And if they'd found it in a prehistoric Homo sapiens settlement, they would certainly have concluded it was a flute. So one paleontologist, let's say Dr. Adler, thinks it's a flute. We have to rethink our knowledge of the Neanderthals. The other, Dr. Eby, thinks it can't be a flute because our knowledge of Neanderthals is really pretty solid. The interesting thing about this disagreement, aside from the fact that we're assuming that both of these people are experts, is the fact that it might be irresolvable. There isn't that much evidence to be had about the Neanderthals. So there may be no confidence that we could do anything like Googling the answer or digging up more settlements or whatever and finding out once and for all what the answer is. But it's consequential because it's going to have reverberations for other things we think about uh, prehistoric um, hominids. So it's rather serious, and it's not obvious what we should do in that case. Well, we should consider our three alternatives. Conceding has no appeal whatsoever. Neither one of the experts should simply jump to the other side, because each is and thinks of himself is as good as the other. Neither thinks he's relatively incompetent. So the two that remain are to ask about steadfastness and conciliation. So let's consider what's to be said for steadfastness. Suppose Professor Charles knows that he's considered the matter carefully and he's come to his conclusion. He's taken account of all the available evidence, he's accommodated the background reasons that are appropriate, and he concludes it's a flute. He knows that Professor Jones disagrees with him, and she's normally considered his intellectual equal, and he considers her his intellectual equal. So he's surprised and maybe a little bit dismayed that she disagrees, but he's dismayed that she's gone off on a false track. He doesn't think that her disagreement is any reason for him to change his view whatsoever. She's obviously made a mistake, so he'll remain steadfast. Unfortunately, she can take exactly the same position. She thinks he's usually pretty bright, knows what he's doing most of the time, but this time he's made some kind of unfortunate error. Maybe he was careless, maybe he wasn't paying attention, I mean, you know, who knows. But she knows what she's doing, so she remains steadfast. Now, the problem with this is that this may make their disagreement completely irresolvable because neither one sees any reason to even take the other's consideration seriously. They're dismissive, they're dogmatic, they're intellectually arrogant, and they've you know, closed off debate on the issue, basically. So this is not looking particularly good. They're apt to remain permanently at loggerheads with each other. They have no incentive to even consider the reasons the other person has in mind. And notice they're also both disrespectful. They say that they think of each other as intellectual equals, but when push comes to shove, they're inclined to just arrogantly dismiss the other person's views. So they actually are adopting a permanent position of superiority. This claim to equality is looking a little spurious here. So let's look at the case for conciliation. Like Professor Charles, Professor Hudson has thoughtfully and judiciously considered the issue, and she's well qualified to judge. She's taken into account the relevant evidence. She's accessed the background information. She's checked her inferences carefully. And left to her own devices, she'd be pretty confident in her conclusion. But Professor Black is her intellectual equal, and he disagrees with her. What should she make of that? She has no reason to think that he has been less careful and judicious than she was, that he was careless, that he was cavalier. She has, she has no evidence of any of that. And she really does think they're equals. 
So she thinks she has no better reason to trust her judgment than to trust his. That's an intellectually humble position. The attitude is fallibilist. I think I know, but I might be wrong. She's respectful of Professor Black in that she's taking his views as seriously as hers. And she now wants to rethink the issue on the basis of their disagreement. Now, it might seem that this is the obviously right thing to do. I mean, particularly the way I said it. You know, he's arrogant, she's humble, uh, he's dogmatic, she isn't. Um, that, you know, we know who's nice here. But the question of whether this actually says anything about what they should do in the face of disagreement has at least one problem in simply going with the humble case, and that's the following. If you say that you should conciliate, you back off from the level of conviction you have in your judgment. And you may back off to the point of suspending judgment entirely, as we saw in the case of what we should think about the Renaissance, or you may just back off to the point of lowering the level of credence you have in your conclusion. But you may back off to the point where you no longer reach the threshold for knowledge. So we get the following, let's say, uncomfortable position. The intellectually arrogant person who is right gets to preserve his knowledge. He knows because he has sufficient reason, that is good reason, to support his true belief. The intellectually humble person may lose knowledge just by conceding that the other person might be right. And that's an epistemological cost. And it also may make the intellectually humble person look like a wimp. Every time there's a hint of disagreement, you, you go from, I might be wrong, to, okay, I won't believe it anymore, or I won't have strong confidence in it anymore. And that, that seems to be a bit of a problem. You don't seem to have the courage of your convictions if you can be moved so easily that way. So we shouldn't assume that there's an easy answer in favor of the um, conciliatory position. But I do want to say that there are some problems that need to be faced here. So I said when talking about the intellectually arrogant person that he may conserve his knowledge if he happens to be right. But this leads to a paradox, or at least a conundrum, that has been identified by Professor Saul Kripke. And that's the paradox of dogmatism. And it goes like this. If S knows that P, then P is true. Knowledge requires truth. If P is true, then any evidence against P is misleading, because P is true. And if S wants to retain her knowledge, she should disregard misleading evidence. So she should be dogmatic. She should simply, having come to knowledge, simply not keep an open mind to any evidence that might appear. Now, this is an uncomfortable position to be in. And it's uncomfortable not just because it, it seems crazy, but also because it throws a strong element of luck into this debate. Since if S knows, if Professor Charles knows, he should disregard the evidence. But we said that he had a counterpart who was his equal, who had evidence. And it seems a very uncomfortable position to be in. It's just lucky that he's the one who happened to get the right answer. So the suggestion is that this cheerful bit about we get to preserve knowledge may be a bit weaker than it actually looks. What we want to do instead is look more at the conciliation issue, because there seems to be something depth to this problem that hasn't been fully addressed yet. And that comes when we ask about what the conciliatory people might learn from their disagreement. Now, I said earlier that the um, conciliatory people, when they were intellect, or anybody who's an intellectual equal, I guess, uh, in a disagreement, you've got the same evidence, the same background beliefs, and the same reasoning ability. So it seems that there's a lot in common. And the question that arises is, how could they disagree? And 
when we look at cases like the restaurant case, you say simple mistake somewhere. The only way you disagree is somebody made an obvious error. But in the hard cases, in the Neanderthal case or other cases we'll consider, I'm going to suggest there's, there's more texture to the problem than we've seen so far.